We can say that Harriet could be late because. <laughs> oh my God. It looks like the stream was deleted on Facebook. Try creating an. <sighs> okay. Sorry, everybody. It looks like Facebook has uh, deleted us. How dare they? <laughs> I know. Did they not know? <laughs> I know. Let me have a look. Oh, I love technology. So we're live on YouTube. So happy World Menopause Day, everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. I don't know how we're going to do this. I've got to get into Facebook. I am sorry, everybody. Oh, Joe, it's another one of our great sessions. Well, it is because because what is in all fairness, we are powerful women, and we will aspire to sorting out all of these problems because we are menopausal, we are empowered, and we are capable. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I think what is important today, being World Menopause Day, is that we at TMC are passionate about helping women in their post-reproductive years. And we do know that heart disease is one of the biggest killers in this country. And we also know that hormone replacement therapy will actively protect women from cardiovascular disease if started within 10 years of the last period. And I just want to say something here, because if your last period was at 57, you're still going to get protection at 66 and a half. So that's what's what's really important. And I've got joined here today by you know my team which i'm really proud um to have on board and we work together to look at all aspects of women's health menopausally and also cardiovascularly one of the biggest symptoms that we have often presented to us is palpitations um and i think what i'd like to, to do is to talk to each and every one of you about your experience and how you know, cardiovascular health and menopausal health converge in your own particular clinical expertise. So the first one, I suppose, I'd I'll talk to Sarah first. And I think that the first thing I would say is that I hear so much all the time in my menopause clinic, I've put on weight, it's gone on around my middle. Okay. And when we need to, we need to break down things. And one of the things that I've always say to everyone is, if you listen long enough to a menopausal woman, she will give you the solution to the problem. So one of the things I've learned from talking to you, Sarah, is that it's so crucial um, to listen to how the, or listen to the relationship that everyone has with food. So over to you. Yeah, that's right, because often most people know what is a healthy eating uh, style of eating. Most people know what will support the problem that they've identified. It's the being listened to, and I'm sure Liz will agree with me here, it's the being listened to and um, be, having someone who's supportive and um, um, just takes time to understand the situation that that individual is in. Because... I could, as a dietitian by background, I could tell you exactly what each of you could eat after I had a bit of time with you. But how is that going to make you go away and make those choices? You, you can't make somebody do something. You have to encourage, you have to support, you have to listen, and you have to adapt to lifestyles. Um, and being perimenopausal oneself um uh, we've having a little discussion before about what we've all eaten some of us have done quite well with our tea today others less so and that's okay too but uh overall if i can listen to someone if i can hear what they're saying actively listening talk them through what they think they can do to make changes to adapt their lifestyles to support whatever issue they've come with then we're going to get much more success from that. 
So it's an it's a really individual approach, which is what we Absolutely. like to do at TMC. It's listening, and in all fairness, there's no point in telling someone that you need to live on cat, you know, on on cabbage soup because you know, if, if you if you walk upstairs, up two flights of stairs rather than taking the lift. That is, again, one of the things I say to my patients in clinic or the nurses say to me, oh, it's all right, Dr. Hobson, I'll bring you the prescription down. I say, no, it's all right. If I burn off one calorie, that's going to be good because then I can have another crisp at tea time. OK, <laughs> so I think so I think it is, it's about looking for little wins and little gains. And mm. you know, in terms of losing weight, in terms of ad adaptation, I'd like to bring Sam in, in here in terms of what your experience is as to how difficult it is for menopausal women to get onto an exercise regime to take that forward so yeah it's i think for any time when there's a change in life starting anything new in the first case is really difficult so even if you were starting getting these symptoms and you starting to have a health check um, with your gp at sort of 45 and all those one of the, that your cardio cardiovascular health is something that could be worked with. Trying to start that at that time in your life is really difficult. So being able to, what you don't want from someone like myself, a physiotherapist, is coming in and saying you need to be doing four, five, six, seven times types of exercise, four, five, six, seven types of times a day, and to carry on being a strong, independent woman working your nine to five, managing children of varying ages, probably some aging parents dropping in there as well. Me just saying, right, you've got to find another hour and a half a day. It's just not really I think firstly, similar to what you were just saying, Dr. Joe, is that getting those little bits of exercise in is good. Um, you know, maybe even something as small as getting the bus, taking getting off the bus a stop beforehand. All right. So you're just doing an extra 200, 300 yards. All right. And then even the car a bit further down the car park. Exactly. Exactly. Or right. you don't you know, push and then even pushing a trolley once you finish the shopping, that's a good weight as well. And you can use that as little ways of just getting that heart rate going to keep challenging yourself and just pushing that little bit extra. See a flight of stairs if you see if you're on a walk and you're around town and you see an incline go go up the incline get faster up in you know beat the person next to you all right there's little ways of just dropping little things into your into your daily life anyway if you're on your own walking fast between this and the next lamppost dropping those little things in really really nice way just to start things off hopefully then in a sort of it's then finding that way of building on those and getting them in sort of two three times two three times a week maybe even you're saying right once a week i'm definitely doing this i'm definitely going on a brisk walk and i'm gonna or go up and down the stairs to, it's a good way of getting your heart going and it can start off really simple so there's it's not a big mountain to climb it's just a big thing to start and i think getting that balance in someone that's already got a quite stressful different life and then having the motivation and I'm sure sort of Liz will um, sort of drop into as well about maintaining that motivation in quite a turbulent time is quite difficult to do. But having someone like myself there is just keep sort of kicking in around the background, seeing how you're getting on, seeing what's it, what's easy, what's hard, and just building on the stuff that you're good at is a nice way of sort of building into that. But there's loads more that can we go on to in terms of the cardiovascular. I'll let some of the other members of the team come into it. Coming and talk thank, for thank you for that, that Sam. I think that one of the other things, I mean, I, in my background is general practice, but you no, know, Dr. Dr. Dard, we've got Rashika's joined us today, and Rashika is a GP specialist and you know, still is very active in the in the world of, of, of general practice. And one of the things that you know I know as a gynecologist or a GP as a specialist gynecologist now that um or from my experience and my referrals in gynecology, you know, one of the presentations in in um, that might happen is incontinence. Okay, mm -hmm. um, because we, we've gone through the menopause, we've sailed through the menopause, um, but we've now we're struggling to get. You know, we get the key in the door and we have to run. Okay, or we've started picking up our grandchildren. Um, and we're we're now finding that we can't pick them up. So I want to come back to you, Rashika in a moment but first of all having brought up the subject of wet knickers i want to bring carrie in here to to work out how we can certainly get some help here in terms of looking at, at a, a you know a physio who specializes in in gyne health and uh, incontinence we can't hear you carrie sorry no problem um, 
<laughs> um, yeah, I think it's one of those things, isn't it, that we all know is happening. Um, people are talking about it a little bit more, but actually, um, you know, when we hit the perimenopause and we undergo all those different changes, one of the things that um, happens is our pelvic floor gets weaker and then we end up suffering with incontinence um, or prolapse symptoms. Um, and the biggest thing that we can do to help that is to exercise our pelvic floor. So like every other part of the body, we've got muscles that we can make stronger um, and we would, you know, keep them active. So that, Susie, you know, to interrupt, you, but that sort of works in with Sam in terms of the collagen and the pelvic floor and strength. Yeah. But, you know, the pelvic floor is, you know, as I've, I've, you know, really learned quite a lot about it recently, but you know, the pelvic floor, do, it does have strap muscles that support the uterus and you know muscles and collagen and ligaments and that's perhaps why sam's seeing people who are finding it more difficult with their exercise tolerance and that's why the pelvic floor is also getting a bit tired too sorry to interrupt there carrie hi yeah, can i just say <laughs> apologies everybody who's just joined us uh, there was a technical hitch. Somehow Facebook had deleted us. Oh, uh, right. But we are back now live on Facebook as well as YouTube. So apologies Welcome, everyone. So we, we might have to go around again, but never mind. We can patch it up. So, Carrie, you were saying about, you know, that finger in the door, think, sorry, key in the door, got to rush to the loo, picking up my grandchildren. I can't do my star jumps anymore because I wet my knickers or I don't want to go to the gym. So tell me, tell us about pelvic floors and that, because that's going to cause stress, which is going to affect our hearts and everything else. Absolutely. And that might, if we're having those, um, you know, leakage when we're moving, we then might not want to exercise. And obviously that's really important and we want to stay active. So the way that we can um, combat that or help it is to start doing our pelvic floor exercises and making sure that those muscles are as strong as they can be to support the activities that we're doing. And it's as simple as, um, you know, pulling up your pelvic floor. So thinking about needing to go to the toilet for a wee, thinking about needing to pass wind, um, drawing up internally so you can feel those muscles squeezing as if you're trying to stop those two things from happening um, and being able to hold that as well so actually you know we sometimes practice all the quick flicks so we squeeze let go squeeze let go and that's good for when we cough sneeze laugh but you know when we're trying to get that key in the door and suddenly we've got that big urge that we need to go and we want to suppress that until we've got to the toilet calmly we need to be able to squeeze our pelvic floor and hold it for a good 10 to 15 seconds at least so that we can give ourselves the time that we need to get to the toilet calmly and not get wet on the way and so when patients come to see you know you Rashika you're in a position to be able to refer patients to incontinence service and um, look at, at other symptoms that they may be coming to you perhaps not necessarily menopausally but they feel stressed mm -hmm. so you know, how else might somebody come to see you you know, saying that because I think one of the other one of the other things I've been reading about is that you know whilst cardiovascular disease is a major killer for women, heart attacks present very differently in women than they do in men, and often they go underdiagnosed because it's attributed to stress. We get indigestion tablets, and sometimes angina isn't quite as powerful a pain for some reason in women. Perhaps we're just used to it because we're being conditioned with labour. I don't know, but um. Can you tell us a little bit more about about the, the stress and the, the 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 heart presentations that you find in general practice? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, I think heart diseases is one of the biggest mimics, isn't it? Because people can present, they can walk through the door with any symptoms, and most importantly, sometimes they could walk in with say something completely different like a sore throat and just mention in the passing oh i've been having my heart you know my heart's beating a bit faster or i'm just been having this little bit of a chest pain which just changes the whole dynamic really to as to how we approach them and it's it's especially important for women i think because uh traditionally we uh, we are taught even right from medical school or even even uh, you know in our experience that younger women don't get heart attacks or don't get heart mm. problems as commonly uh, and men do more often but we know over the years that the dynamic the whole epidemiology is changing more and more women because of our lifestyle because of our 
um, you know, uh, stress levels because of our eating patterns and, you know, the whole changing dynamic of how women work uh, and the social demographic. Heart disease is increasing in women, ischemic heart disease, wherein, you know, things like heart attacks and angina are increasing in women. And uh, absolutely, the presentations are, are uh, varied, um, you know, indigestion, um, heart heart rhythm abnormalities sometimes they can just be feeling short of breath and sometimes it's just um symptoms that mimic anxiety and we just have to be careful about sort of eliminating through different questions as to what you know and, and getting to the crux of the problem so yes they, they, there is a very presentation um that that people can present with absolutely mm. And I think I think what's lovely here is that we're talking about heart disease, but the presentation of you know, stress and anxiety. And we all you know as as clinicians, we all know you know, you know to protect our hearts, we we might, we shouldn't smoke. We should moderate our alcohol intake. We need to think about our dietary intake. We need to do um, exercise. But that's protect our heart, and that's good for us in, in uh, moderating our menopause symptoms, um, and it's also good in protecting us from type two diabetes. And I, you know, one of the things that happens to me is that you know I see patients in my clinic, both in the NHS and in um, private practice, who patients who, or, or ladies who have had their their um, HRT stopped or um, or MHT rather it is now. <coughs> hormone treatment and it's been stopped by their general practitioner perhaps because they've noticed their blood pressure has gone up and so they've stopped their general so they stopped their blood pressure uh, sorry stopped their menopause treatment and then surprise surprise their blood pressure's gone oh. up higher. Um, <laughs> and because you know and they've got more stress because they feel even worse and so you know I'd like to sort of bring Liz in, in here a little bit talking about stress and and how that can actually affect our menopause and, and it's also interesting to try and unravel the aspects of you know, what is stress because it's normal stress or is it stress because you're estrogen deficient? And I think that's also something that's really important. And if you're really stressed, you can't exercise, you can't eat properly. So and, you, you know, you, you then feel not like doing any exercise and then you, you know, end up having, getting um, wet knickers because you haven't been out for a walk and or you've been for a walk and you've pushed yourself and it all gets far too much so you know I think it's really important to really look at the woman as a whole and that's what I think we do at TMC we look at the the whole woman um, and the whole woman into her post-reproductive life so Liz could you just share with us a bit of your thoughts about stress and menopause and how that impacts the heart Absolutely. And I, it's really interesting because what you were just saying there, Dr. Joe, and the sense of how all of this is so linked, listening to everybody. I'm here with my pen and paper sort of making crazy notes here, like thinking about so many things that people are saying that that's triggering me in the sense of, yeah, absolutely. And the links between absolutely all of this, which is why it's really good that we are so holistic or try to be so holistic. And I, I, I was sort of thinking a lot there about what Sarah had said and about how often the people that we talk to, the women that we talk to, whatever age, whatever, whoever they are, often have a really good expert knowledge about what it is they need to do. And they're really good at helping other people and telling other people what they need to do, but not so good at telling themselves. And I have this sort of mantra that, people that have worked with me probably will remember and I sort of say you know go and stand in the mirror look in the mirror and talk to yourself <laughs> and say to yourself what you would say to your best friend or to somebody else that needed some advice the whole thing about looking after yourself about listening to your body about checking in with your body body scanning about mindfulness about if you can look in a mirror outside even better because we know that being outside is really good for us. So all those sorts of ideas and absolutely checking with your body. And if things are changing and thinking about that stress and thinking about what your body is communicating to you, making sure you talk to somebody about it, making sure that if you are concerned about something that's happening, make sure you talk to your GP, make sure you speak to a professional person so things aren't missed. Because I think 
like what Rashika was saying, like what everybody's saying here, is sometimes we tend not to do that. We're not very good at listening to ourselves, at listening to our breathing, at listening to us. Um, so that really is is sort of it sort of takes says says everything. There's so much, but that for me is about how we check in with ourselves, really. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's really, sorry, Rishi, you're going to say something. No, no, I, I was just going to pigeon say that sometimes, I mean, as uh, you know, uh, as as a person approaching maybe the perimenopausal age myself, I mean, even as professionals, I, I just think that even if as a healthcare professional, although you are so aware of all of that that but as a woman sometimes you can be a bit reticent because you just kind of let things go along or maybe you know you do a breast yeah. examination or you feel something's not quite right but you know it, it'll be okay and we just we just let things pass and I think that's it's important perhaps to talk about just just not letting that feeling go away and talking about it because you know there are things which which are at a salvageable point things have detected early whether it is chest you know cardiovascular issues or breast awareness if detected early things can be curable and a lot better and I, it's it's something i tell myself every day as i'm telling my patients i keep thinking am i doing this and i kind of reinforce that you know if you know what i mean it's just important even as women as healthcare professionals to be aware and and pass that message on to our patients because we can sometimes go into denial even even knowing everything so and, 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 sorry, sorry. I, I was just gonna say sorry i was just gonna say it's that again for me it's the idea about the relationship between stress and body and then body and stress so how stress can affect our body and how our body can affect our stress so thinking about that as a cycle i don't yeah. see it as one and the other i think it's a complete cycle that is really helpful to think about and that sort of mix fits in with what I was just about to say, because one of the things in body and stress is that, you know, I do see a number of um, women who come to the clinic who are really keen exercisers. They've been they, they go to the gym. They are really up here with their fitness. And then all of a sudden um, they can't the exercise ability has dropped off they can't you know they, they can't do what they used to do and that for them because they are very keen gym attenders is very very stressful um and i think that's because the way our joints and our collagen as you uh, you know as, as sam and carrie have said um do change in how our bodies can to deal with exercise how, do you find that's the case sam yeah, one hundred percent. I think there's there's so many different aspects of the musculoskeletal system that's affected during menopause. Um, I won't want to I won't dive too much into it. Try and keep it a little bit more specific to the cardiovascular um, sort of nature of today, anyway. But we've got the collagen uh, fibers in our tendons um, decreases post menopause. Um, that also then subsequently affects the uh, the uh, the. Uh, cartilage inside our joints to prevent them so, so that it stops them getting stiff um and then more likely more towards the cardiovascular aspect of it we get this um this muscle tissue as well starts to not break down but become less efficient um and then makes it harder to to move and move quickly and as efficiently as we did previously and the heart's made of muscle so all of the fact that we've got these little aspects throughout the cardiovascular system of uh, so the musculoskeletal system of the tendons not working as efficiently, the joints not working as efficiently, muscles not working efficiently, that's going to put a little bit extra on that heart, all right? And just because we're going to have to start pushing that pushing that blood around to make everything work a bit, a bit more efficiently. And within within that, it's about bringing, your, bringing the pressure off yourself a little bit. The cardiac base is still there. Someone's cardiac base is still there. But what's happened is the musculoskeletal chain system has gone through a change and that's the difference is the cardiac so people feel they should be still achieving what they were previously um but when people are post-menopausal that that issue affects them. that musculoskeletal system is affected so much that the cardiac base is still there it's just achieving something different because the musculoskeletal system isn't working as well all right so it's not about thinking that our body and our heart and our lungs aren't doing it as well they are the musculoskeletal system just needs to pick up that little bit more and it's just altering the way you're changing your um your movements a little bit 
one and one of the things that you know you said that we've got muscles and tendons and you know without one of the things that we hear postmenopausal talked about is i think i've got a prolapse okay that's a word that you know goes through you know most women it, it creates such such a bizarre fantasy about what actually a prolapse is and i think you know as clinicians we we need to be far aware, very wary of what we we describe as happening to women anatomically because of how they think about that's going to affect most you know their bowel urinary and sexual function mm -hmm. um and and back to a, a you know if women have spent hours pushing if women have been you know not only just a baby but perhaps they've been chronically constipated carrie you know with with sam talking about collagen in ligaments and muscles what if you don't know you know our, our uterus is actually slung it's a bit like a it's a bit like a, um, a hammock it's it, it, and it sort of hangs there with with ligaments in our pelvis so when the collagen in the ligaments in our pelvis and, and in our other joints as Sam has said earlier starts to decrease so it's not surprising that our pelvic floor tends to to give a bit so we do all need to, to work hard, and it was interesting that um, my, from a very young, uh, from a very age, and I talk to every guy and patient I see, I talk about the Squeezy app and looking at pelvic floor. And in, interestingly, it was my daughter um, at the age she was in her late mid twenties who suggested to me that I download the Squeezy app and tell my patients about it because she she did it very regularly. Um, and and I think it's really important that we. No, there isn't. You're never too young to start doing your pelvic floor exercises at all, ever. Um, and that that maintains good pelvic pelvic floor health. Do you, do you, would you agree with that, Carrie? Absolutely. And I think that the earlier we start, the better, um, because if we're not exercising those muscles, then they will get weaker. And like you say, when the collagen levels start to decrease. Um, and the, the ligaments and the passive support that's holding all of our pelvic organs in the right place, when that starts to decrease and those pelvic organs start to shift and sit a bit lower, we need the active support underneath to hold everything in the right place. Um, and yeah, to, to keep us dry and to keep us comfortable. And I know kind of we mentioned as well a little bit about stress and it was making me think about the pelvic floor and its response to to stress and how we hold stress and tension in those muscles as well so if if we're you know stressed and anxious then those muscles might be stressed and anxious as well and and actually a little bit too tight so then they're just constantly working at this middle ground and when we then really need them to support us when we we cough or we sneeze or we laugh or we try and exercise <clears throat> suddenly they can't do that because they're too tired from that constant state of just mm. working away all the time yes and and the I, I, can like, i go. jump jump in there because we've got a question coming about this you've all mentioned collagen and um this this person has asked and i see this all over social media people constantly asking what collagen supplement should they take now i i want to ask you do they work or is it just down to diet and exercise or is there a magic elixir that we can take or is it menopause hormone therapy so our estrogen our progesterone and then a load of supplements so this is what this question's asking because you keep all mentioning collagen and you can't turn on social media without seeing somebody promoting why the collagen they have is the best so sarah i think that's firmly <laughs> your <laughs> right well i have looked a lot, a lot of research around this I um, know you have, which is why I asked the question. <laughs> the short answer is it's unlikely to make any difference taking an oral supplement of collagen. Um, the research that's gone on with it is very varied. It's looked at different types of collagen. So it's looked at collagen from various animals. Um, most collagen will come from animals. There is a vegan version as well. Uh, it's looked at um, 
versions within that. It's looked at different areas of skin that they've assessed to try and see if there's collagen works. But the truth is uh, you are probably just spending a lot of money on something that isn't going to make an actual difference. Psychologically, it may make you feel a bit different. Spend the money. Evidence, <laughs> it, it, spending money, yeah, like treating yourself to something, making yourself of value. Um, but there isn't enough evidence out there at the moment to say, absolutely, this really, really works. Um, and the evidence that is there is so varied, so many different supplements, um, sources of collagen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I honestly would say, don't waste your money at this point in time. But the research is ongoing, and obviously, as with a lot of advice, the, di uh, the, the, the advice could change. It's never likely to be uh, um, physios. You can jump in here. It's it's highly unlikely to ever be something that will help it with collagen in a big way as we age unless they get very very clever with co collagen supplements but as for menopause um and postmenopause and skin changes don't waste your money it's I, I would have to agree with sarah there i think there's loads of things that can be really this, what happened, collagen at the end of the day is a protein we don't absorb protein by just picking up collagen and putting it in our bloodstream we break yeah. it down into amino acids and then build it back up in our body yeah. so does it give you the building blocks yes does it give you the building blocks like any other decent amino acids varied diet um you know you only fish your uh, meats different nuts um you know all the other stuff that sarah knows a lot better than i do um because yeah um but is it just going to give you the same building box? Yeah, I don't think there's necessarily anything out there that is good. But I also think if you're someone who doesn't eat a lot of fish, doesn't eat a lot of fish and um, meat, and you're happy to get your collagen as that source, then I think that's not a bad thing. I think there's definitely ways of using it, much in the same way of anyone going to the gym um, using protein powders. Yes, I mean protein powders are easy, but is sometimes a steak also a good way of getting meat as well yes so it's uh very much if you think that's the thing that's helpful for you and it makes you feel like you're getting those amino acids in brilliant but i think from a this one is going to stop you having collagen issues then no <laughs> i don't think there's any particular ones out there that are great but any to be honest seem quite fine to be honest because there is an awful lot of stuff i mean you know i sort of decided i was going to have two months of this revolting powder that was supposedly of a natural taste and it was you know from um marine thingy and it was this and it was that and everything else and it was <coughs> and i thought i can't actually see much difference so um i i and i spoke with sarah and and sarah sort of reassured me that i'm much better to eat uh, protein and, and fish and meat because you know as but going back to medical school, you know, we take protein into our body. Our gut breaks down protein into amino acids, collagen, because it can't absorb it in any other way. Yeah. So yeah. everything that we take in gets broken down. And I'm sure, Rashika, you'd agree with me here that the benefits of a healthy, balanced diet far outweigh the, all the money that you can spend at Holland Marrow. Oh, yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, especially, and I, I find it challenging sometimes and, you know, uh, with patients coming to us about queries with all sorts of, um, you know, uh, food supplements and, and, um, and different kinds of sort of fasts and fasting techniques and what, you know, it is, it, it is um, sometimes um, out of the remit of what we can advise but i can i can only say sort of going back to basics going back to med school um and you know learning about the various dietary components you do understand the importance of each one of them and how each have a role to play in the whole you know in in the biochemical processes that happen in the body um right from your carbohydrates to proteins to your micro and macronutrients like vitamins and minerals and and you know much as you kind of try and imagine you can't imagine a process where having each of these components in the balanced in a balanced proportion is not important so yes i would completely agree that a healthy balanced diet um completely agree with not having 
processed foods as we were at a recent conference joe at the mm -hmm. at the bms conference where we talked a lot about the gut microbiome which uh, surely Sarah can, you know, shed uh, more light on and how each one of us has a different, different kind of world in our gut, a different microbiome, which which might be very specific to each one of us. And, and it may be dependent on a lot as to how we were brought up. And, you know, sometimes when we say home cooked food, you know, uh, you know, my mom's here and, you know, just going back to what you ate as a child and how when life was simpler and diet was just really balanced and home cooked food people were less obese you know you look at you know you look at our parents generation who exercised eat ate three meals a day ate ate healthily ate a balanced diet and didn't have a lot of these problems that we they, face today they, well people do exercise and i think it'd be fair to say that all of us here um are very much aware of this you know, epidemic of you know I, i'm going to say the word obesity that is, yeah. is out there and it puts everyone's heart at risk it puts them at risk of diabetes it puts them at risk of ca cancer of the breast or cancer of the over a cancer of the uterus and i think we really need to try and get the message across that it's so important to eat a healthy diet and it yeah. is more difficult and i accept that because when you know when i was little when the dinosaurs ruled the earth you know i used to come home <laughs> from school get out of my school uniform and go out and ride my bike with my friends outside or from primary school we live in a cul-de-sac and we were doing lots of physical exercise um, and you know i i think I, my memory may be wrong <coughs> we used to walk to and from school two or three times a week and so we didn't have so many cars so people generally did more to more day-to-day -day exercise and i know that there's all the issues about protecting our children and of course we should but children aren't having the opportunity to do the exercise oh, not yes. outside school but also within school in the same way that they did and exercise relieves stress doesn't it liz you know that's one of the things that is really important oh absolutely uh, absolutely exercise relieves stress and i i guess the other part of it is is somewhere there needs to be, I guess, conversations about how much exercise is too much exercise, mm. because we also yes. see that as well, that can be unhealthy in the same way. Particularly younger women, don't we? Absolutely. Well, and what effect that that has on their hormonal health. And they're and again, back, back to both that idea that it's also very linked with cardiovascular health and that same old mantra about time to breathe and time to stop and time to check in with yourself. And and I, I, it, the other thing that it made me think about while you were talking there, Dr. Joe, was the sense of, you know, we're talking about the mind and the body as a system. And I was sort of thinking as a systemic therapist, I guess, but thinking about the systems of families and what's, you know, the stresses that are happening in families at certain times. Also thinking about whether other people in the family and what their cardiovascular health is like, because obviously genetics is, is important here as well. So all this like lots and lots of conversations that need to happen i think about um sort of but what you're saying sorry but as menopausal women we get to a certain age and we've discussed you know very busy lives so you know when we're saying exercise we don't expect us all to be down the gym in my life that's just not going to happen and my friends we've all got kids that are just going off to university or they're doing GCSEs, and we've got all of that going on. So when we say exercise, do we mean that going for a walk is we're enough? Talk, we're talking anything, really. It's taking those little opportunities, taking those little wins, all right? When you've got a life, a busy... Unfortunately, I'm dual income, no kids, so I'm living quite a happy life, whereas I can imagine not everybody falls into that, into no, that room. Absolutely. The, um, no, um, today um so i've got a, i've got a lot re, not really too much uh, not really any excuses not to exercise but you know people who still have kids who are you know, taxing them around still get the opportunity and that is some, something as simple as pushing yourself as i said sort of mentioned earlier probably the facebook list is weren't necessarily in but it's about getting that getting your heart going and taking that opportunity all right if you're going to go up the stairs go up them quickly if you see a slight incline when you're out on a walk do it a bit faster. Um, you know, if you're uh, picking up the washing basket off the floor, do it 10 times, all right? Put it, do, um, lift it up, put it back down, lift it up, put it back down. Dropping those little things to tell those muscles to work, tell that heart to work, get that going is a good way of just starting off, starting off. And it just changes that mentality. Then it's something as simple as just showing up. So saying, you know, 
one day a week, you're going to go for a walk with your friend. All right. You're going to go off for a little walk. So it's hard to have a conversation. So you can still have a catch up. Um, but rather than you go for a walk, you go for a walk to have the coffee and then skip on the milk and the, and the cake on the side of it. All right? Little, little changes. Still get that relief from your social side of it. It's going to help with stress management. But then teaming that up with going for a good exercise, getting your heart racing. To be fair, at this time of year, when it's quite a crisp morning and you've got your heart race going and you've got a, got a jacket on, and you take it off and you get into a coffee, lovely kind of feeling. Lovely feeling. Or I have a sit down with a friend and you'll, oh, yes, have your hands around a nice cup of hot, hot, hot tea. It's a really nice feeling to be able to get, um, to be able to do. So I think it's first taking that opportunity and then just showing up once a week. And then you'll find that things start changing and you start changing and then it's building on there. But that's again. Yeah. And exercise helps with your speech as well, doesn't it, Sam? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing we haven't really mentioned so if far. If you tired, your brain will be tired. Yeah. And, yeah. and if, you, if you can't sleep, then you get more stressed. Um, you know, and I, I suffer from chronic insomnia and, you know, I know how stressful it is when you, you know, I don't know if any of you else out there plays the wordle game, but my start word is weary. Um, and the number of days I write weary into wordle when I'm having my cup of tea in the morning, because that's actually how I feel because I haven't slept properly. Um, and, you know, to, to wake up in the morning when you feel weary and you've got the kids to get sorted and you've got to go to work and then, you know, wake up feeling refreshed. What's that? You know, I don't know what that feels like. Yeah. And often that's, that can all happen. And, and we mustn't forget our partners here in this journey either, because, you know, we're talking about menopause, women and heart disease and stress this evening. And of course, you know, stress and heart attacks and, and or does run in families. But also, it's really stressful for our partners as well. So if our partners are struggling with stress because we might not be well, because we're going through the menopause, then it's how we help our partners deal with, with the, the symptoms that we are experiencing and going through, and because that can be stressful for them. And of course, you know, men are more at risk of cardiovascular disease. So it, it really is, it's sort of like a big massive jigsaw, but sometimes mm. I feel the point, the pieces of the jigsaw are all moving a little bit at the same time, a bit like those those staircases in the Harry Potter films, you know, they, they sort mm. of move, move around a bit. So, so we've, we've got another question. Um, we've obviously been promoting the, uh, someone's asking that uh, we call it menopause hormone therapy and not HRT. So, Joe, do you think you can explain why we feel passionate about? Well, I, I feel passionate about it because I sort of really, um, hormone replacement therapy is a, a very old fashioned term. It replaces your hormones, um, but it's a very generic term. OK, so as I when patients say to me, well, I don't want to take HRT because it's unnatural. OK, um, I, I, it's to put something back into my body. And one of the things that, you know, those of you that know me will have heard me say years over the years is that, you know, it's hormone replacement therapy. It's replacing a hormone that our ovaries can no longer produce in the same way that we take thyroxine if our thyroid doesn't work anymore. And we don't bat an eyelid about taking thyroxine for life. Again, if our pancreas doesn't work anymore and we're given insulin, Insulin, again, is a hormone, just like thyroxine, just like estrogen. And we don't bat an eyelid about taking insulin. So you could say that insulin is HRT. You could say that thyroxine is HRT in the pure sense of the word. So I think it's great that we've now shifted to MHT, menopausal hormone treatment, because we are specifically talking about hormones for the menopause. Mm. So that's, and that's a, a modern new phrase that is coming in. I'm trying hard to remember to use it all the time, but it makes it very specific because why, we, why would we not want to replace our, a hormone that we can't produce anymore, like estradiol? We take it for life, okay? It's safe for life. We know that estradiol is safe for life, okay? Um, and in, in the vast majority of women, in the same way that thyroxine and insulin is, it is safe. The only women who I would definitely not suggest taking uh, estradiol MHT are the women that have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. 
But in severe cases, when the estrogen deficient symptoms are so severe, then I do see some women in my clinic and talk to them about estrogen replacement. I would put a caveat on there about estrogen replacement in the vagina because estrogen replacement in the vagina will help your water work. It, uh, will it not carry? And it's safe for women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So okay. hopefully that's answered that question. Okay, so next question would be, as a non-medical person, you're talking estrogen positive breast cancer. Does that mean that there is breast cancer that isn't estrogen positive? Well, I can answer that, but I'm sure Rashika can answer that because you uh, see that women with lots of different types of breast cancers in your primary care practice. So could you perhaps give us your thoughts on that, Rashika? Yes, there are uh, there are different types of breast cancers. Now, when, when we say estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, so these are the there are specific um, receptors on the breast cancer cells, the growing cells that actually um, respond to the circulating estrogen and the breast cancer grows as a result but there are other kinds of breast cancers uh, which have different receptors on them which are not specifically um you know they, they do not grow specifically in response to estrogen so estrogen so, so having a lot of estrogen around does not necessarily have an impact on the growth or or spread of those kind of cancers so yes there are estrogen receptor negative breast cancers as well and can but, those people have estrogen replacement yes they can, yes, they can. Yeah. i think they, they can and i think there's something called dc uh dcis which is dutch carcinoma in situ which is when if you that sounds really complicated but you know I, for those of you that know me i can't do complicated language i have to talk simply so ductal carcinoma in situ dcis as doctors call it actually if you break it down is the cancer is cited in the ducts of the breast it's not actually in the breast tissue so that is also not a, you know it's not a, a reason not to have hormone replacement therapy understandably there are many doctors who are very concerned about prescribing um uh, MHT to women who have a history of DCIS and uh, non-estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. I think that in the vast majority of cases, then most GPs would probably would refer for a specialist opinion. And once they've had a specialist opinion, would thereafter be happy to prescribe it. I think that, um, and of course, there are other treatments, not just MHT, for women who do have estrogen receptor positive um, breast cancer, which we can, with lots of stuff on our blogs, on our website, that we can see all about that. Because it, I think one of the things that women worry most about is uh, breast cancer. Um, but interestingly, you know, we don't tend to worry about heart disease and we don't tend to worry about osteoporosis and we don't tend to worry about dementia in the same way as we do about breast cancer. Absolutely. MHT will protect us from all of those and all of those other three are more likely to kill us yeah. than breast cancer. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and we know now that women who are on HRT, although uh, have because they are more breast aware they tend to examine their breasts more yeah. and if the breast cancers are detected in women who are on hormone replacement therapy on on mhd those tend to to respond better and have a better prognosis absolutely absolutely and women who have a family history of breast cancer that is not a reason not to not take them. hormone replacement therapy so or just, MHT, as a, just as a recap then mht doesn't cause breast cancer Fact, fiction. Right. MHT does not cause breast cancer They're in terms of estradiol. MHT is broken into different types of hormones. The hormones that are in MHT are estrogens, or in, mostly in the form of estradiol. Estradiol is safe for life. The other hormone that you will find in MHT is a type of progestogen. There are different types of progestogen. The majority are synthetic. There is one progestogen which is body identical, which is eutrogestin or 17-beta-hydroxyprogesterone. That one does not have any increased risk of breast cancer. But we do have to say that if you put 
all of the types of MHT in a big pot and you gave it to patients to take for five years, you would find a 0.02% increase in the risk of breast cancer or the incidence of breast cancer. And that is because some of the progestogens are not quite as what I call clean as the other ones. It is still a tiny, tiny risk compared to the risk of heart disease, diabetes and dementia and osteoporosis. Okay, but there is that small real. So we cannot categorically say that MHT is risk free for breast cancer. It is some are, but you do need to be aware of what you're taking. And sometimes it is about looking at the risk of what else you're trying to manage within that particular individualized patient. And that's what we like to do at TMC. We like to have a look at an individualized approach because sometimes if you aren't overweight and you don't smoke and you have no other risk of a breast cancer with no family history, but you're really struggling with really bad bleeding problems, then it may be that one of the other progestogens may suit you far better. So it's about listening. It's about listening to the patient, listening to their hopes and their fears and their story, which is so important as far as menopause care is concerned. I'm sure there's other risk factors that are likely to increase likelihood of breast breast cancer other than having an MHT over five years. For example, a bottle of wine a night, I'm sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Five years, years. I'm uh, sure. Actually my water up. No, 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 yeah. nothing, to, nothing towards you, Dr. Joe. Nothing towards no. you. Two, <laughs> two, two, drinking two, drinking more than two units of alcohol a day. And yeah. a unit is actually sadly a lot smaller than we think is going to increase your risk of breast cancer far more than hrt okay is that the same with being overweight as well that has a bigger it has a far greater risk yeah. of being overweight but that's back to your heart as well but being overweight will have a massive problem on your heart and also affect your risk of breast cancer and also affect your risk of endometrial cancer and you will see i think we put it on um, certainly in one of our talks, we've got a slide, Sally, that we, we know where all the, there's all the little ladies that go pink and, yeah. and they're yellow. Um, and you can see how many get are more risky if you have this or you don't yeah. do that. And you see that women who are on estradiol alone or HRT okay. are actually you know, much not, not at risk at all. Yeah. So but the, get, thank you for bringing that alcohol in there, Sam. I've forgotten about that temporarily. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. But they women with estrogen positive breast cancer can have vaginal estrogen. Absolutely, categorically. Right. Throw the leaflet away <laughs> in the box. Throw the leaflet away. And in Nottingham, the breast cancer surgeons are happy to give a letter to GPs, to patients, to give to their GPs that say, we are happy for this lady to take. And because it is safe for life. OK, taking vaginal estrogen for a year is less than one milligram of estradiol per year. And we've already ascertained that estradiol is safe. And in all fairness, if you've got a stretchy, sexy, wet vagina, because I will get that phrase in there somehow, Is somewhere, it? okay, you're more likely to want to have sex, which makes, and you're less likely to wet your knickers, and sex is good for energy, and you're burning off your vascular is, system. And it's good for your system, it's good for your immune system, and so it's a win, win, win situation, Sally. Well, you've just brought me into another question because obviously, you know, I'm avid on social media in lots and lots of groups. And one of the things that I see a lot is that women are talking about low libido and or it's gone. I, I, I read one the other day of a young lady who has just decided it's over. It doesn't matter. She knew this day would come. She's in her 40s and she doesn't care. And it's just packed its bags and gone. And I felt really sad because I wanted to say, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is two years of working with Dr. Joe. Orgasms are fabulous. So, sorry, Sam. I agree. But, 
Yeah. <laughs> but, you will not hear me guess that. The, the amount of people that straight away jumped in on this woman who, who wasn't on MHT and told her that she needed to get testosterone. And a really, you know, Dr. Dar, you know, Liz with um, the cancer. Can you explain between all of you why testosterone is not always the first option to jump into in this situation? Rashika. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to repeat what Joe says. <laughs> oh, you're putting you to the test. You see, I can answer that question, you see, because that, you know. I think as as we uh, I'll just put it simply I think I think um sex is just not a physical act isn't it there is so much more involved there and that is that is the message that we at the TMC uh you know under under Dr Hobson's uh tutelage as I must, might say you know have learned and have, have have gone on to sort of disseminate um uh, the 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 expression that obviously it's, it's a combination of a lot of things happening together so just attributing it to to a deficiency of testosterone because we're not you know women do not produce a lot of testosterone anyway so if 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 we equated having lots of testosterone to having a great sex life then the higher testosterone we have the better sex life we would have but that's not really as we say a linear relationship so there are so many other factors that we have to to optimize to to achieve um, a, a great um, a great sex life and that is where that's where an an MHT testosterone therapy is just a small part of it. So it's Absolutely. addressing all those issues, the psychosexual elements, the the urogenital, you know, the health of the vagina and and the area surrounding this, uh, you know, and the tissue health, the the pelvic floor health your psych psychological health there's so much that goes into it and and i'll then come to to dr hobson to elaborate well, on that well, it, well it, there is so much that that goes on to it and you know i i talk about my sort of six circles and and you know it, the, one of the biggest causes of loss of libido is that you actually don't fancy the person that you wake up next to you next to and in all no no testosterone is actually going to change that okay and if you know, if the vagina is dry and sore, it will send a message to the brain and it will say, I don't want anything down here. So the testosterone can't be used. And what we also need to remember, which we need to get the message across, is that there is there, there is not this holy trinity that Davina McCall goes on about, of testosterone, progesterone and oestrogen. Because oestrogen and progesterone are made solely in the ovaries, whereas testosterone is made in the adrenal glands as well. So we don't have that precipitous drop in testosterone that we get of estrogen and progesterone so yes i do prescribe testosterone yes i'm a great advocate of prescribing testosterone and there's loads of stuff and we can't open, we can't talk about it today about brain function and testosterone much as i would love to but you know you do exercise you release endorphins it makes you feel good you have sex it makes you feel good but you know if you put on weight and you get out of the shower and you look at yourself in the morning in the mirror and you think Oh dear, when did that happen? In my head, I don't look like this. So that in itself is actually going to make you not feel as attractive. And that will have an impact on your ability to use your testosterone. If you're all worried that you might wet yourself during sex, that is something else that crops up. You know, what's going to happen? I don't want to have sex because I've got a prolapse I might wet myself. So that will switch off your testosterone. So it's really, really complex. And so it's give test. I manage people's expectations very carefully before I prescribe it. And everyone has this long, complicated conversation with me about whether testosterone is going to work or not. And I say, I don't know whether or not or it will work, but we need to go through this. And I think the other thing is that vaginas are a bit like computers. They have very long memories, okay? So one thing that does crop up is that at a time when sex isn't very good and it might be a bit uncomfortable, a vagina might remember a time when it wasn't uncomfortable, when it was uncomfortable before. And that <coughs> go back to previous relationships, could go back to difficult doctor's examinations. 
but it might even go back to something that happened to you when you were little and that's a real shock and often we don't really have to have it we don't really acknowledge we don't know that that's what's happening so that's why it's really crucial to have sensitive conversations with women about their loss of libido when did it happen how did that happen because you know i do psychosexual medicine as well as um, menopause care and that's what i am really strongly pushing and, and, and encouraging all of our team to be very much aware of this impact that uh, testosterone may or may not have. So it's not the answer to everyone's dreams. Okay, so one last question, because I, I sort of appreciate we've been going for an hour now. So the biggest question, and I see this all the time, MHT, I started taking MHT and I'm putting on loads of weight and I can't get rid of it. Is there a link to weight gain and taking menopause hormone treatment? Sarah. Well, no, is the answer. Is that is yes, it's what I was exactly what I was gonna say. Sarah's no. not the answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Unfortunately, um, alongside being the age you are when you go through menopause, you're also at an age where your body is changing and that's males and females um, and we talked a bit before about muscle mass will change um, fat mass can change you can stay the same weight you can gain weight uh, and may lose weight that's less likely to happen but where you store that weight that the excess weight will change so you might go from a pear shape to um what do they call them? An apple shape. Well, I There's... think if you become a pear, you become you go from a thin pear to a fat pear. And if you're yeah. an apple, you become applier. But if you're if you're taking uh, MHT, you are replacing the hormone that you are losing or that that will drop off naturally through perimenopause, menopause. Um, so no, it isn't the cause of it. There are likely to be other things going on. Reduced physical activity what you were eating that used to keep you stable through the previous 40 years of your life all of a sudden is actually a little bit too much because your physical activity levels have dropped all the stress or everything else that's going on so the other thing to add in there sorry sam you're going to say something just, just simply, there's muscles you know a third of the is a, well three times denser than fat so you know a bit of a bit of muscle that's this big is this big in 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 fat right so that, just seeing that in front of you that same weight may your weight may have been exactly the same but you've lost that little bit of muscle mass that muscle has increased slightly but it just looks a lot more different in the mirror and i i think the other thing is that um we we also know that um when we women's weight might stabilize if they've not started mht right at the beginning of the menopause um and they've there been a time without being tr starting their estrogen we know that every single system of the body has estrogen receptors and when we become menopausal these systems in the body cry out for estrogen and they shout the brain included um, and they shout at the brain to do something, to, 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 to solve the problem. You know, the brains, the gut, the eyes, the heart, the lungs, the uh, let alone the genital system, all shout to the brain and say, do something, we feel awful. And the brain says, yes, I do too. And the only thing that the brain can think of doing is laying down fat cells because it knows that fat cells secrete a weak estrogen, which is estriol. And... Therefore, we become mummy bears. We become brown bears that want to go into hibernation in winter. And we put on fat around our tummies. OK, but sadly, we are not brown bears and we don't go into hibernation. But it's the same actual mechanism in terms of producing that. So we get this weak estriol. And that's why women who are overweight do produce an excess of estrogen, which does put them at risk of an endometrial cancer, which is why sometimes we do prescribe double doses of progesterone, which is what you need to protect the lining of your womb when you take estrogen HRT or menopause HRT. And that's why we will double the dose if you're overweight. Does that answer okay. your question, Sally? There's, there's yes. like thousands and thousands of pounds ploughed into, because you can imagine, you know, 
the the definitive does does uh, hrt put on weight because it was we had to prove that one way or the other but it doesn't okay hrt per se does not put on weight might make okay. you feel a bit bloated. okay thank you so i think that's a really good place to end because it sort of brought us round full circle and i hope everyone that joined this evening and watches afterwards as well understand why at the menopause consortium we are a team it's not just the medicalization of the menopause there's so many different facets and how we treat everyone as an individual and i just want to thank everyone our great team here tonight for joining us thank you happy world menopause day everybody bye everybody you, bye. 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 bye 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 Yes, to do.